Hello guys, I would like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. In this week's lesson, the pastor will share with you this week's powerful Sunday School lesson review. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you would like to donate to our new Bethel Baptist Church Ministries, you can donate any amount to P.O. Box 18661, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and zip code 39404. Also, cash app capabilities in the descriptions, and don't forget the pastor's Sunday school lesson notes are below as well. God bless you guys and enjoy the lesson. Hi, I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday school lesson for July the 7th 2024 is ceaseless love. And our Bible scripture today are taken from Lamentations, the third chapter, verses 16 through 24 for our printed text. And we are still in this quarterly theme of hope in the Lord, this absolute certainty and expectation of coming good that is found rooted in the Lord himself. And we're uh, in this unit of study for this month is expressing this particular hope, this this certainty, this this absolute certainty in coming good. Uh, and we, we know for a fact it is going to happen. And so we, we go into this, this ceaseless love and this is Lamentations. This is the, the book in the Bible that has some of the saddest things that are that are written in it because it is written by a person, I believe is Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. The historians, some of them said that Jeremiah is the writer. I know some of the people that say that we can't be certain about who is the author of the book, but it has some of the same writings and teachings of Jeremiah using the daughter of. He is the only other person that uses that, that particular phrase. And, and so it, it, it is more than likely that Jeremiah is the writer of the Lamentations. Lamentation is a short book that expresses deep grief over the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and also the temple. These, these big, these icons of the, the his, he, Hebrew faith, the uh, uh, Israelite uh, faith. The, the God's chosen people. Its English title comes from the Greek word, uh, uh, Greek verb meaning to cry aloud, which accurately describes the content of this book. Jeremiah sitting on a hill, watching the destruction there in 586 BC, could have gotten out of the city, could have gone a different way, could have even been treated fairly good, but decided that he was going to stay right there watching the destruction of, of Jerusalem and, and the tears would well up in his eyes and he began to lament over Jerusalem. He, he began to be sad about what was going on as Nebuchadnezzar came in and began to destroy the place because Zedekiah, the, the, the vassal king that he had placed there in charge and, and to run the area of Jerusalem had turned against him and tried to team up with the with the Egyptians and he took Zedekiah and had his eyes put out just as he saw his sons killed and then he kept him in captivity just as the people that he took back to Babylon he kept them in captivity but this it, this is lamentation this is the the crying over that for 40 years Jeremiah had told the people that these things were going to befall them if they did not listen to the Lord. That at one time, Jeremiah probably had a different type of hope in the person of, of Josiah when he came in and the law of, the, of God was found in the temple and it was read to the king and he rent his clothes and he wanted to start a reformation and, and people start to living right and them start to do things right and the, and the law of God would be read and the people were attending to it but, but Jer, uh, Josiah was killed in, in battle and then things began to take a, a, a downward spiral again. It began to go down again. And then when Jehoiakim got on the on the throne and Jeremiah, because he couldn't go into the those particular areas of the city, 
he sent a scroll into the, the king, King Jehoiakim, and he cut it up and threw it in the fire. Jeremiah wrote another one, but these things were definitely going to come to pass. And now he's getting to see them sitting on this hill, watching the destruction of, of Jerusalem, and it, it brings tears to his eyes. He is saddened by the things that are going on that are happening as, as the, the place is being torn apart and torn down and the artifacts of the temple are being hauled back to Babylon. And, and, and in the first chapter of this, just to, just to kind of set this up, he was going through some things, looking at some things, uh, uh, the poet uh, or I, I would say the prophet. It say in the 12th verse of that first chapter, it said, there's nothing to you, people that are passing by, all you that pass by. Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. The Lord has afflicted me. I, I saw these things coming and they, here they are. Today is the day that they're happening. For these things I weep, verse 16 of that same chapter said, the first chapter says, my eye, my eye run down with water because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me, colon, my children are desolate because the enemy prevail. And, and this man was, was very much saddened because of the things that were going on in and around the temple, this uh, in and around Jerusalem. This is that time what, that Ezekiel wrote about when the glory of the Lord was leaving the temple, had left the temple, when it, when it raised up above the, uh, to the, uh, above the cherubims and, and then started to move out in, into the uh, away from from the from the temple, and then finally disappeared there in the tenth and eleventh chapter of Ezekiel. The the glory of the Lord had left the place. Well, the glory of the Lord had to leave the place so that the enemy could come in. Well, why was Babylon coming in? Why were they coming in? The people had not given the land its rest as the Lord had required there, as He had, he, had, he had set up the people there. But but that wasn't the big thing. The big thing was idolatry, was the, the disobedience to the Lord, was the rebellion against the Lord. That was the reason for, for all the things that were befalling the Jerusalem area. And they, they're teaming up with other people and, and not doing the things that the prophet had, had even coached them into doing so that the Lord would spare them in things the people just kind of turned against. And then the, the first chapter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this from a different translation from the for, uh, just so that we can get, get through this in the third chapter. It says, I'm the one, beginning at the first verse, just, just setting us up because these things are going downward. They are going downward at a, at a fast pace. The, the sorrow, the, the things that are breaking the heart of the, of the prophet are, are, are spelled out here in this. For I'm the one that has seen affliction under the rod of God's wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Against me alone, he turned his hand again and again all day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. This man is really feeling the pain of what is going on here in and around Jerusalem and the temple. He has besieged and he enveloped me and in bitterness and uh, with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me sit in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has put heavy chains on me. Though I call and cry for help, he shut out my prayer. This man said that the Lord had shut out his prayer, had stopped listening to him. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, on, on a couple of occasions, God had told Jeremiah to stop pray, praying for the people of Israel. And I don't know, maybe sometimes God is telling us to top, stop praying for certain people if we would just listen to the Lord because he has put a fix in to fix that person. If, if he takes away that fix because you're praying about it, he has to put in another fix to fix the fix that he put in place to fix them in the first place. But, but now he's telling Jeremiah on several occasions in the book of Jeremiah to stop praying for the people. But now Jeremiah is saying, you're not even listening to my prayers anymore, Lord, here in the eighth verse of this third chapter. He has blocked my ways with, with hewn stones. He has made my path crooked. The 10th verse says he is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. 
He led me off my way and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate is what the prophet says here. He bent down his bow and set me as a mark for his arrow. He has his arrow directly aimed at me and has, has pulled back the, 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 the bow so that it can shoot. He shot into my vitals, the arrow of his quiver. He, he said here in, in this, he has become, a, uh, he's, he said, I have become a laughingstock or derision as is written there in the King James Version of all my people, the object of their taunts and songs all day long. He has filled me with bitterness he has stated, stated me, sat at me with wormwood. He put these, these things in me, at bitterness, and, and that's where it stops because we start into our main our, our lesson in our printed text at, at this at this very point. The I'm a derision. People are laughing at me as, as I as I sit here. And, but these are things that I told them were going to befall them if they didn't turn back to the Lord. These things are are, are happening now. These, these people, the, the, the things that, that are going on at, at this time. So now we get to the 16th verse of this, our printed text. He said, he has also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He has covered me with ashes. Now, the person speaking here, as I've, I've just told you, that I feel like it is the prophet Jeremiah speaking to the Lord, and the Lord has, has left him, him and the people Hopeless at this at this time, hopeless and helpless, not knowing what to do, not who, knowing who to turn to or where they can turn even for help at this time. The judgment and the wrath of God are so severe that it feels as if his teeth are being ground in the gravel and completely broken out. It feels like he's, he's just, his face is down in the ground and, and, and he can't move one way or the other without his teeth being broken out or he fell flat on his face as these things were happening, as these things are coming because of the judgment and the wrath of God on the people for their rebellion because they have turned, turned against the Lord. The Lord has caused me to, to, to crouch in fear and shame in ashes or cower it has caused me to cower down in, in, in fear and in, in shame and ashes. Now, there is another translation that some say that, that this could be talking about. Another look at this is associated with, with the dust and the, and the sackcloth uh, with, with being, being things of symbols of mourning and lamenting over something or, or someone or a certain situation. Or, uh, and, but I don't really think it's, it's going on like that, but still that, that can be another way of looking at, at the teeth being broken in the gravel in, in the stones that, uh, with gravel stones and he covered me with ashes. That those are things that happen. Uh, the, the cover with ashes are things that happen when a person is, is, is in deep mourning, but I don't believe that's what's going on here. I believe this is all because of the rebellion against God and, and the disobedience against God. However, as a matter of fact, we know that the people of Jerusalem or Judah at this time and, and in and around the temple were going through the judgment because of their rebellion against God, their, their disobedience uh, 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 with God. They weren't, disobe they weren't obedient to God, so their disobedience is causing the things to befall them like this. God actually prepared the Babylonians as a rod of correction for his people, the Israelites. Well, how do we know that? We know that for sure because it was the prophet Habakkuk that told us and, and when God told him to write the vision and make it plain. God said, I raised up the Chaldeans. That would be the Babylonians. That's another name for the Babylonians. And I made, I raised them up to chastise the, uh, my people, the Israelites. Well, at that point, Habakkuk decided he didn't want God to come down and judge them like that. Don't, don't do that. But God let this man know to write the vision, make it plain, so that even when a person run by, they can understand exactly what's on that 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 paper or that the billboard is sound like what he was telling them to do, so that they know exactly what the Lord was doing. When he said that these Chaldeans would be swifter than eagles and they would come in. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar came in there, it seemed like he had track holes and back holes because he was able to tear down the gates of the temple. Yeah, I mean the gates of the of the city and. and and tear down the temple itself. It just seemed like he had stuff that was far advanced in it, uh, of his time. But we know we know he didn't have them. But it seemed like it because God raised them up to be his rod 
of correction for his people, the Israelites, because of their disobedience and their rebellion against God. They're mainly their idolatry and going against the things of God. Verse 17 says, and thou has removed my soul far off from peace. Colon, I forget prosperity. He, he said, thou has removed my soul far off from peace. The Lord, you, Lord, now you have purposely bereft or taken away my peace is what the, 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 the poet is saying here. You have purposely taken away, you have bereft me. You, uh, I'm bereaved in this particular situation. It's almost as if I've lost a loved one or something. You have taken it away. You have killed my peace. My peace is dead. Peace there is, is the, 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 the word shalom. It means completeness, soundness, welfare, and, and, and or as, as is stated in this particular context, it is uh, contentment. I have no contentment anymore. There's no tran tranquility. It's not as if I'm sitting by the stream and I see the water going down the stream and everything is beautiful. All of those things are gone, but even to the point of even safety in the body, I don't feel safe here anymore. So all my peace, my contentment and tranquility, they're gone is what the prophet is saying here uh, or the poet or whatever, whatever we say. I'll probably keep saying the prophet because I believe Jeremiah wrote it. But, but he said, it's all gone. It's removed. How far is it removed from me? It's gone or far off. It's gone. I, I can't even remember the last time I felt contentment is basically what the prophet is saying here at this time. He had preached for 40 years to the saving of none. Now he's not seeing any peace here at this time and hadn't saw it since the days when Josiah tried to start a, 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 a revolution or, or start a, a, a reformation, rather, rather is the word I was, I was trying to say, a reformation of the, of the people of Israel going back to the things of God, getting back to temple worship, getting back to doing things the way that God wanted them to do. He hadn't saw that type of peace. And now it's been many years from that and, and now he can't even remember the time that, that, that the peace was really there. Real peace is just so far from, removed from him that he can't remember contentment anymore or even safety in the body. I've forgotten what it feels like even to be happy. That's what prosperity means here in this. It doesn't mean a, a, a load of money or a load of stuff or a load of thing. Prosperity, Hebrew word tov, it means in this case, happiness and welfare. Things are well in, in you. Are going back to the word that there in at the uh, before the colon peace, contentment, tranquility. I just can't remember the last time these things happened. I can't. I can't feel. I hadn't felt felt happy in a long time. Is what the prophet is saying here. He said, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. My strength and my hope that they they have left. They 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 perished from the Lord is perished from the Lord. Say my strength here means my, my eminence or, or my fame, which some of you would call his, his glory. It, it, his glory, or it, 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 it has left him. In other words, it's dead. It's gone. I, I, I don't feel it anymore. My, my strength is, is, is all gone. It, it, it is left because my strength was tied and in tune with the Lord. The Lord was the one giving me the strength that I, that I had. It, it, my enduring and lasting uh, uh, everlasting spirit is gone now. It's, it's, it's what he's feeling at this time. Now, we know he is not gone. And he knows because he's a prophet of God. God called him when he was, he said, God told him, I've even called you before you were conceived in your mother's womb. But still at this time, he's not feeling it. He's not feeling the Lord. It is almost as if just as we saw at, at, there in the 10th chapter of Ezekiel, the, the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. And then in the 11th chapter, just finally leaving all together. Now this man is feeling like the Lord has left them. He's not hearing his prayer. He says, he's, he's, he's saying, Saying there, but uh, he said in, in the previous verses, he said, but my hope is perished from the Lord. My strength and my hope are perished from the Lord. My hope or my expectation of, of coming good or, or this, this, this wonderful thing that's supposed to be there, it, it's gone from me. I, I can't feel it anymore. It's, it's not here with me. The, my, my absolute certain expectation of coming good it's just gone. I, I don't feel it anymore. I don't have that hope within me anymore. My strength and my hope were both rooted 
in a particular place. They were rooted in the Lord, in the God that I just said that doesn't even hear my prayers anymore, that has set up lions and bears to attack me, that has put me here in a place of derision where people are laughing at me. That same God, my hope was rooted in him and he has left me, so to speak, and he's feeling that. It seems as if he had just, just walked away from him and not even looking back at him just as the glory of the Lord had left the temple. Now he's feeling like to Jeremiah that the, that, that the Lord himself has left him. He said, remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall here. He said, remembering my affliction, my, 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 my affliction, a, a real reflection, reflection, always looking back, looking back at the way things were, or sitting in a place of, of observing things. Uh, my observation of this, looking at it carefully, taking another look at this, or even considering it, keeping it going in my mind, or just, or, or as he says here, remember, I was just thinking about my affliction, my, my pain and my suffering, what I'm going through, what me, the people and I are going through, but right here, I'm just focusing on myself, my affliction, my what my pain and my suffering, and and, and just, just thinking about it. Why is it coming up on me? Well, I know it's because of rebellion and disobedience obedience because I preached to these these people for 40 years and they never turned back toward the Lord. I know it's because of that, but I want to take a closer look. I want them to make a reflection. I want to consider the things here as, as, as he's talking about here. Thinking about my misery, that, that's how I'm homeless at this time. I'm sitting here on this hill and I can't go back home because Babylon is tearing apart the city and is tearing apart everything there, hauling everyone that they don't kill or the women that they rape or everything that they mess up, they're hauling it back to Babylon. And so I, I'm homeless at this time. I'm a refugee at this time. Also bringing me to a place of bitterness. If this is, this is bitter or even misery being outcast or in a place of destitution. I'm, I'm destitute at this point. I don't have anything. I can't even go down there and get food from the, from the house because of what Babylon is doing to the city of Jerusalem at this point. If the wormwood here is, 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 is a plant, it's a tree, but is, he's talking, he's using it in a metaphoric state here. It, it means bitterness. That's exactly what it, what it means. And gall comes from a poisonous tree or a poisonous plant. And it is sometimes called venom because venom comes from uh, here. Speaking of a viper, when you're bit by it, it actually kills you. So he's saying that my affliction, my pain and my suffering, my homelessness has put me in a place of just basically being dead, bitten by a viper and venom is going in. The poison and the bitterness have overtaken me and, and, and my soul has them still in remembrance. And has humbled me in me and is humbled in me. He said, my soul still have these things in, in remembrance and, and it, it is humbled in me. He said, right now, the affliction and misery, along with the bitterness, have taken up residence in my mind and can't be moved at this point. It, that's what's on my mind. I can't see a change because everything I see is that the Lord has turned his back on us. He has walked away from us. Jesus cried out on the cross, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? That's the way this man is feeling. He's feeling that they have been forsaken by the Lord. Even though he knew it was a cause of rebellion and disobedience, because of what they had done, because of their own sins and all cause of their own things against God, that they were going through it, he was still feeling this at this time. He said, my soul has still in remembrance. This, it, these things are still in me. The affliction, the, the misery, the, the pain and the suffering and the homelessness that I'm feeling, the, the refugee, the destitution that I'm feeling right now is because uh, it, uh, it's in me. I remember this. I can't get it out of my mind. I can't clear it from my thoughts. That's all that's there when I sit down and think. Vernon McGee said that when someone is talking about you and trying to put you down, he said, you can't do anything about a bird building a nest, but you can keep them from building it in your head. Sometimes the weight of the world comes upon us and things get built in our head. It seems like even if we try to, to fight them and keep them from happening, that's what was happening with this man. It's going to change, but right now, that's that's where he finds himself. This depression of the mind has bowed down within me, 
or have humbled me, has brought me low. I can't get anywhere else. I can't think any, anything else. I can't get beyond this point, but thank God for the Lord. And, and, and that, that's where he found himself, even at this point. My soul has them still in remembrance. I can't move past it and it's humbled me and brought me low. To the, and it's when we're in our lowest state, that's when the Lord can really start to work. When we are in our greatest extremity, when we have come to the point where there's nothing else we can do, when it, when it comes to the point where we're hopeless and helpless, Paul was told, in your weakness, I'm made strong. And when, when, when we're at that lowest point, it wasn't until that man found himself there in the pig pen about to eat the, 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 the husk or the, the, the shells of the, from the peas, the pods that the, that the pigs were eating, that he came to himself. He found himself at the lowest state of his life. When we get to the lowest state, when there's no one else that we can call on, that's when we realize that we can call on the Lord. That's when we find ourselves going back to our roots or going back to what we've already found and, and know about the Lord. At that point, verse 21 comes in. He said, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. Now, as he got to the lowest point, where these things had clouded his mind, where he couldn't see the Lord anymore, where everything else was, was gone, nothing else was in his, it, 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 he, he couldn't see past the clouds, but past those things, but past the misery, past the affliction, past the pain, past the suffering. All he could do was focus on those things that he was feeling and seeing the destruction of the city. He couldn't get past that. But even in the midst of that, the Lord came through. He said, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Where, where, what was his hope at previously? Verse 18 told us, it was coming from the Lord. All his hope was tied up in the person of the Lord in the first place. So now when he's in his lowest state, he sees the Lord. But this is that but God moment that comes in here at verse verse, verse 21. This is that but God here in the middle of this, this particular book of, of Lamentation. The mind that couldn't shake the pain, the suffering, and, and the homelessness now begins to focus on the Lord. In the Hebrew, this means to make to return to my heart. The Lord comes in and he floods in and to, to this man's heart. While he was in his lowest state, the Lord, that was when the man was there in the pig pen. He realized that he was the son of a father and he could go back to his father's house. Even if I can't be my father's son anymore in that particular way, maybe I could be a servant and I can eat better than I would, I would be able to eat in this pig pen. But, but, but he was a son. So the father was going to restore him and put him back to a place of sonship. So that, that, that was never a point. So he, he came to himself. This man came to himself, Jeremiah did. And therefore I have hope. He found hope right there with the Lord. Isaiah said, said this in the 26th chapter of Isaiah, the third verse. He said, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. That person, that mind stays on thee. They, they trust in the Lord and the Lord keeps them in perfect peace. This man's mind was wrapped up, tied up and tangled up in the misery, in the affliction, in the things that he was going through, the pain and the suffering and, and being homeless at this time and, and being in destitution at this time. He was tied up in that, but now his mind focuses back on the Lord and he found peace. When, he, when we focus ourselves on the Lord, we'll find peace. When Peter was walking across the water, Lord, bid me to come to you if that's you. And he got on the water and he began to walk. But when he took his eyes off of the Lord, the, uh, the Bible said that he began to sink into the water. And he, but he did know to focus back on the Lord. He said, Lord, save me. And Jesus picked him up. But still, when we focus on the Lord, we have peace. We find perfect peace. The children of Israel. Jesus talked to Nicodemus there in the third chapter of the gospel according to St. John. He says, so as the son of man lifted up the, the uh, so as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up 
above men. Well, when, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the people were trying to escape the serpents that were crawling around on the ground. And if they were bitten, if they kept their mind on them being bitten, they would die right there. But if they would take their mind off the situation and focus on the Lord, so to speak, as the serpent was being lifted up, if they focused on them, he would keep them in perfect peace. As a matter of fact, the Lord said he'll save their life if they looked up. And, and, and that's the same, that's what Jesus was talking about there to Nicodemus. All that would keep their eyes on the cross, keep their eyes on Jesus Christ, the person that is there up above us, the person that will keep us in perfect peace. It will keep our minds and hearts stayed on thee. He will take care of us. He will bring us through. So this man, he recalled to his mind. Now he's finding himself in a place of finding peace with the Lord, finding that shalom that we were talking about earlier. So the, now the prophet expectation returns. And he starts to focus on the Lord himself. Just keeping my mind on the Lord, then I don't see myself even talking about the other things while I'm focused on the Lord. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. He said it is of, of the Lord's mercy. The Lord's mercy. Now, the Lord here is in all caps. That means this is Jehovah. This is Yahweh. This is the creator of everything. And, and this is this is God. This is the one that spoke as we talked about last week and said, let there be. And there was. This is the God that, 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 is, that can do anything. There is nothing impossible with our God. It is the it is of the Lord's mercies. This is it, this is of his, his steadfast loving kindness that, that we're not consumed or completely holy or entirely finished or ended at this time. We, we're, we're not consumed or taken away or thrown away at this time. It's because of the Lord's mercy, because of his steadfast loving kindness that we're not at the end of our lives at this time. His compassion, his compassion, because of his compassion, because his compassion fails not. This is God. His compassion fails not. His compassion will never cease. It will never end because God is true to who he is. He is God. He is perfect. There's no, no failing in him at all. Compassion, that, this is the sympathetic pity and concern for the suffering of, and, and misfortune of others. That was, the, that was real in, in the Lord. When he saw the misfortunes of the other, when Jesus walked on this earth, when he saw the misfortunes of others, he had great compassion on them. We look at them and we point our fingers at them when we see them as sinners, but he saw them as people that needed pity, that needed compassion, needed some mercy, need someone to care about them. Mercy is me not receiving the punishment, the just punishment that I should receive. Grace is me getting a gift that I definitely don't deserve and, and, and that can't merit, can't earn it at all. So this, this, this is this wonderful grace and, and uh, this wonderful mercy, loving kindness, steadfast loving kindness, steadfast because it'll never change. It'll never stop. Loving kindness of the Lord. They are new. How often? Colon there at the end of every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. At the beginning of every day, the Lord has more mercy or steadfast loving kindness and compassion to distribute. At, at, the, at the beginning of every day, this, this, this takes us back to the days of wilderness wandering also. When the children of Israel, they were told one day that they were to collect enough for the previous day. But if they collected more on the other days, then it would ruin and rot before the next day. They were told that manna would be there for them every morning. That's what that's what this this loving kindness is for us. This this compassion, this and and this steadfast loving kindness, God's mercy is baked up and and ready a new batch every day, ready for us to consume, ready to give to us, so that it, so that it's there for them every morning. They are new every morning. He has new mercies. New compassion every morning. And how wonderful is that? Great is his faithfulness.
great or, or abundant, is it? That's what we just found out. It's more than enough. It's plenty for everything that we need. It's more than enough. Is your faithfulness, Lord, toward us, your stability. You're very stable in the things that you do for us, Lord. There's, there's no shadow of turning, as the hymnologists say with you. You you don't change because even when we do change, you're, you're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, the 13th verse says, we believe not or we have lack in our faithfulness sometimes, yet he abided faithful, colon, he cannot deny himself. Even when we're unfaithful, God is still faithful. Even when we're untrue, God is still true. God is still going to be him, himself. When, 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 as, as we use as an example again, when Jesus was sitting there with her and the men had thrown down their rocks and, and gone away, and, and Jesus said, where are your accusers? She said, I have none, Lord. He said, well, neither do I. And, and, and then after that, he said, go and, and sin no more. Well, Jesus knows the, knows the human being. He know, David said, he knows my flesh that I am but dust. But, 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 but what would keep her after that if she fully trusted in the person that she had just had this conversation with? What, what David said there in the fourth chapter of Romans. When he said, blessed is the man in whom his sins are not imputed to him. They're not put on your side of the ledger anymore because you believe God. You believe God. He counted you as righteous, those things that we had gone over in previous lessons. And, and in, in Titus, just showing how true and what God was really talking about, the apostle Paul told Titus this. He said uh, in, in, the sec, in the first chapter of Titus, the second verse, in hope of eternal life, which God, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the beginning, before the world began. Now, every morning, God's promises are sure. He's faithful. Great is his faithfulness. If he said that we are going to have eternal life, he means that we're going to have eternal life. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, he's promised you eternal life today. If you lose your eternal life tomorrow because of some act that you did, then your eternal life was never eternal yesterday. He's faithful even when we're not. People are not faithful. We give up on people and we put them down. But look at the wonderful thing that's said here in our last verse of our printed text. He said, the Lord is my portion. That's my share. Save my soul. Therefore, will I hope in him. Therefore, will my hope, my, my confident expectation our certainty in coming good. My, it's right there in him. The Lord is my portion. The Lord is my allotment or my share. He is, he is what I'm going to receive in this. And, and, and this is the response of my inner being. My soul is telling me this is what, what, what the prophet is saying at this time or the poet, as some would like to say. He's saying that, that, that my soul is telling me that the Lord is my portion. As I look around and they're taking away everything, they're ramshacking the city. They're taking the artifacts out of the temple. Everything is being marched away that's worth something to Babylon. The people are being marched away to Babylon. Some are being killed, some are being hurt. But here is what I found even in the midst of this, that the Lord is my portion. That's what my inner being is telling me. That's what my soul is telling me, that the Lord is my portion. Therefore, will I hope in him. Therefore, my confident or certain expectation in coming good is found in him, steadfastly and secure in the person Jehovah, in him. And that's where I'll find myself, my portion, or my share of this, this whole thing. In the Hebrew, this means that, that to, to wait patient, just as Job said, I'll just wait right here till my change comes. A waiting attitude is what this means. When, it, when, it, when he says this, the Lord is my portion, so is my soul, therefore will I hope in him. I'm just going to wait right here until this hope shows up, until this confident expectation come, comes to fruition right here in front of me. Now, where did this come from? In, in Numbers, the, the 18th chapter, the 20th verse. That Aaron was told something by the Lord. The Lord told Aaron, he said, look, Aaron, you're not going to get any land. And the Lord spake unto Aaron. He said, thou shall have no inheritance in their land. Neither shall they have any part among them. Wait a minute, God. If I was Aaron, I would say, wait a minute. Everybody else gets something and I don't get anything. But here's what the Lord said after the colon. He said, I am your part. 
I am your portion. If I don't have anything else, if I have the Lord, I got all I need. That's what, that's what he was telling him. If you don't have anything else, I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. I'm your portion. The Lord is my portion, the prophet said here. Therefore, my soul is telling me this. Therefore, I will find my hope in him. That's a love that's not ceaseless. That it, it doesn't stop at all. It continues through everything else that I'm going through. When I can focus on the person of the Lord, when I can keep my eyes, when I recall to my mind, there I find my hope. Therefore, there, that's where I find this confident expectation in something good that is coming. I find it right there in the person of Jesus Christ. That's where our hope is wrapped up now in the person of Jesus Christ, the person that died for our sin, was buried and rose again. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we do pray that you will give us that heart and mind, that we will take another look, that we will recall and find ourselves in, in, the, in the midst of that expectation of coming good, in the midst of that hope that you have put in us through the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that even as we find him, that we will understand this love that does not cease, that it is forever, that you are faithful even when we're faithless, that you will be true to yourself no matter what. So Father, we do pray that even at this time that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.